Hi everyone, it's Ania Mokhtadir here. I am a senior interpreter at Connor Prairie. If you all have been keeping up with the Connor Prairie at home content, you might have seen me. You might have even heard me talking about making this video all about 19th century hygiene. And while I was doing research into this topic, I reached out to my coworker, Jenny Sherrill, who's also an interpreter here on the grounds. And I just realized that she knows so much and she's so good at her job that I didn't think I would do it very good justice and not like she can. So we decided to sit down and we had a little bit of a video interview where we talked about the most popular um, questions that we get asked while we're out on the grounds and she was nice enough to answer them for us. So that's what this video is going to be about and I just wanted to point out that we, we also thought this would be a fun idea because we get asked a lot while we're in costume or on the grounds how we prepare for our jobs, how we get in the mindset for our roles that we, we take on. And I think that short answer is you research, you go out there and you just practice and you just do it until you figure out what you're best at and you ask each other. We're always surrounded by people who are just wonderful people who know so much about so much <laughs> and um, who are just so lovely and they never, they never mind to help and we never mind to help one another. So I think that's such a beautiful part of Connor Prairie and so I think this video kind of reflects that about how we work with one another. Um, so we really hope that you enjoy it. I know that you're gonna love Jenny and if you stick around till the end of the video, I'm going to do just a quick little wrap up where I mentioned some topics that didn't quite make it into her answers but that I know that you all would be interested in because we had a chance to talk about it in our interview and I don't want you to miss out on that content. So hope you enjoy it and um, you'll see me after Jenny answers her questions. Hi, I'm Jenny. Um, I'm an interpreter at Counter Prairie and I have been part of Connor Prairie for most of my life. I was a youth volunteer when I turned 13 and I am not 13 anymore. And uh, I spent three years as a youth volunteer and then four years as paid staff in my teenage years and into college. And then I thought I should get real jobs. So I went out and got some real jobs and um, yeah, I don't like real jobs. I like Connor Prairie jobs. And so then I came back when I was in my later twenties and I have been around ever since. So, um, that's, um, been a number of years. So what do we use to keep our teeth clean in the 19th century? Of course they have no toothpastes and no concept of fluoride in toothpaste, but what might we do to keep our teeth clean? Most of keeping teeth clean is about scrubbing off stuff that collects on it, what we would now know as plaque, and also taking care of offensive breath. So if your breath stinks, you're going to want to take care of this. Lots and lots of books give suggestions of concoctions that you might use to clean your teeth. From the Quaker Woman's Cookbook, use tincture of myrrh mixed with water to harden the gums and Peruvian bark applied at night and rinsed off in the morning to preserve teeth. What's Peruvian bark? Well, this is kind of cool. Peruvian bark shows up in a lot of different substances that you might make for um, hygiene or health and was available at your, um, your store. Peruvian bark is actually a substance that has quinine in it. And quinine we know today to be an anti-malarial and health treatment. So pretty cool they were using some of those things that we now know to be healthful today. Another receipt is what we call recipes. A receipt from the frugal housewife says use honey mixed with charcoal to cleanse teeth and make them white. The honey is going to hold the charcoal in. The charcoal will scrub the surface of your teeth just like those whitening toothpaste today. And charcoal is also known to remove contamination. Again, lime water and Peruvian bark may occasionally be used for those with defective teeth or offensive breath. Other concoctions for your teeth include snuff, which is finely ground tobacco, and flowers of sulfur which is actually a sulfur substance. So some better than others. Now I would encourage you to give a try to something like um, honey mixed with charcoal or maybe not. So 
what about dental health? How do you keep from losing your teeth? Well, in the 19th century, they really hoped their teeth didn't fall out, but they had a backup plan. Do you ever wonder why young adults get wisdom teeth? Do they really need an extra set of teeth? Well, most of us don't. I had to have mine taken out. My husband had to have his taken out. Most folks have their wisdom teeth taken out because there's no room for them. But what if you lost a couple of your teeth on each side? Maybe molars that are used as chewing surfaces that got cavities and got rotten and ended up falling out. If those wisdom teeth came in, they would fill a space that teeth had vacated earlier and you would have another set of chewing surfaces in your mouth. There is some suggestion that perhaps drinking hot liquids like coffee or chocolate might be bad for your teeth. <laughs> the best um, excuse or reasoning that they give for this maybe being something that is bad for you is that the people from Mexico drink hot drinks like chocolate and coffee and they have bad teeth. Oh, well, so do we Americans and maybe we don't drink those things. Hmm. Anyhow, as far as hot drinks being bad for your teeth, I'm pretty sure that this hot drink is good for everything. A little coffee to get me through the day and a cheery message on my mug. But maybe it's not the coffee or the chocolate that's hurting your teeth. Maybe it's the sugar. When I'm working in Prairie Town in costume, almost every day somebody asks me, how do you take a bath? And that's a really good question. In the 19th century, bathing, as in getting your body all the way down in the water, is not considered something that you would do for hygiene. In fact, there is a tradition of bathing that is for health purposes. Soaking in hot water removes the impurities and makes you feel wonderful. Hence, baths at places like Bath or other um, cities in Europe. But bathing to get clean isn't going to become a thing until the later part of the 19th century. So how do people clean their bodies? Well, first of all, ugh, they don't. Um, there is a thought in the... 18th century and into the 19th century that really all you have to do to keep your body clean is rub the dirt off. And fortunately, you are wearing every day something to take care of that. And that is your shift. The shift is the bottom layer of clothing that you wear. This is my shift. It's made out of linen. And if you know about linen, linen is sort of a coarse cloth, especially when you first start wearing it. And it softens over time and as you wash it. Um, and it was thought that as you wore that against your skin, it would actually rub any dirt off you. A man wears his shirt as his bottom layer. The same thing is going to happen. That's just going to rub all the impurities off and you can change this shirt or this, this shift and you're going to be just as clean as can be. <laughs> um, if you were noticeably dirty, your hands and your face, you might wash those and you would encourage your children to wash behind their ears where you could see dirt growing. But as for the regular person, not so much with the washing. Now, you would actually, if you were of any sort of social standing, wash yourself. You probably have a bowl and a pitcher in your room or in the kitchen near the fire somewhere that's warm. You could pour water into that pull your sleeve out of your shift, wash your body with water and a rough cloth. That's all. No soap. And you might do that periodically to get yourself clean. There are people writing, even in the early 19th century, about the need to take this layer of gunk off your skin that accumulates through perspiration. <gasps> but those people were really ahead of their time. And most folks were not following those instructions true. So 
washing your skin, rubbing it with a rough cloth is thought to be healthful. It's thought to remove all those impurities. Um, why aren't you going to get into a tub? First of all, it's not seen as healthful. Second, how much water is it going to take to fill a tub to wash in? I'm going to tell you, it's a lot. You can't heat 10 to 15 gallons of water over your fireplace for baths. Later in the 19th century, when people start having stoves in their kitchen, that becomes a little bit of a different thing because they can heat more water on the back of the stove. That could just sit there heating all day. And in fact, some of the stoves even have reservoirs in the back that they could fill with water. So you might have a warm bath by the end of the 1900s or the 1800s, but not before that. Also, just a little note about getting into water. People in the 19th century don't swim. They really don't swim. They don't even know how to swim. Swimming also doesn't become a thing until the end of the century. So women are not getting in the water. They're not bathing. Boys might get in the water to play, but not to get clean. Um, your clothes are not getting washed either very often. And you might think that people smelled sort of bad. They did. But... If everybody smells like that, you don't notice so much. One of the things that we like to say in Prairie Town is we try to be very, very historically accurate, except in the places where we don't. You will find that our bathing principles do not measure up to 19th century standards. We're way cleaner than they are. What about washing your hair? How did people in the 19th century wash their hair? <laughs> Guess what? They didn't do that either. In fact, shampoos like we know them today were not even invented in the 19th century. The word shampoo actually refers to a massage of the head. And the first shampoo lotions start coming in the second half of the 19th century and are substances made to facilitate the head rub not to clean your hair. How do we keep our hair clean in the 19th century? Well, you will see when you go to Prairie Town, ladies wearing day caps. These day caps are not worn like this. My hair would be all the way back inside that day cap. The day cap is not about modesty. It's about keeping my hair clean. Dirt is going to land on this day cap and I can wash it and keep my hair from getting dirty. But you and I all know that dirty hair is not just about dust and dirt from outside falling on it. It's also about the hair getting oily and gross. Well, we've done that to ourselves. Your scalp has the right amount of follicles to produce oil for your hair. And when you wash your hair, you wash the oil out, so it needs to produce more oil. If we wash our hair too often, we actually dry our hair out, which makes our scalp want to produce more oil, which then makes our hair oilier. So if when I was a child, I had never started washing my hair often, if I had kept it covered and I had brushed the dirt out regularly, my hair wouldn't overproduce oil, at least it would eventually get into a good equilibrium. In cultures today that don't wash their hair regularly, most of the people have the right amount of oils for their hair. They just need to brush it to move it from the scalp to the ends of the hair. And so overwashing it actually can make your hair oilier. So what do we use on our hair? Well, there are a lot of instructions in books like The Frugal Housewife or other places that tell you to rinse your hair with alcohol, brandy, or rum. Now, I got to try that out on one of my friends once several years ago, and she went for quite some time without washing her hair. When she rinsed her hair with the alcohol, we used brandy on one side and rum on the other. There wasn't really a notable difference between the two. But what it was supposed to do was sort of cut out some of that oil and make the, the frizzy flyaways less wild. 
Um, she was really happy to wash her hair after that with real modern shampoo. But a lot of the uh, the alcohol, if they were going to pour it on, it would help to clean out some of the dirt and grime. What else are you going to do for your hair? Well, you could use hair powders. Some of those hair powders would be things like starch or flour that would absorb some of that oil from your scalp and they would mix in with it perfumes, rose or lavender or something like that so that your hair would smell nice because hmm, if you're not washing it, it's going to smell bad too. You could also make pomades using lards and oils and waxes that would smooth it down because you would still have perhaps some of those curls that would fly away in the sides of your face. You know, wearing a day cap is not just keeping your hair clean. It also helps keep it tamed and out of your face so you don't have hair in your eyes when you're trying to do things and so you don't get hair into your food when you're cooking. Really, it was a oldie timey hairnet. In the 19th century, you couldn't necessarily go to your local store to buy hygiene and beauty products, but there were dozens of books with re recipes, which we call receipts, that would give you instructions on how to make those things at home with ingredients that you could buy at the store. One of my favorite books is called Mackenzie's Receipts. The earlier edition has 5,000 receipts, but then Mr. McKenzie expands to 10,000 receipts, and they are receipts for everything. Tanning leather, cooking food, keeping yourself beautiful, keeping healthy, all kinds of things. The best thing about McKenzie's Receipts, both kinds, the 5,000 and the 10,000, is that they're available for free on Google Books. However, when you're reading a book like McKenzie's Receipts or The Frugal Housewife or any other one of these great books that have such good information, you should probably keep your Google handy because they used a lot of ingredients then that we know are not healthy now. One of the things that they would do is have receipts for taking away your freckles if you were in the sun too much. And those receipts usually involve some sort of acid, burning away that layer of skin. Good times. Or they might use um, a powder to make themselves look pale because of course, pale was the look. Very, very porcelain white complexion was considered the standard of beauty in the 1830s and beyond. So they might make a powder out of something, maybe out of pearls. Yes, there was pearl powder made from ground up pearls or maybe some nice lead to make your skin look white. Now we all know now that lead is very harmful to your health, but that didn't stop the ladies of the 1800s from powdering their faces with lead. There is another substance that was used in the 1800s to make a lady's skin look nice and white, which actually would turn black in the presence of certain chemicals. That is one of the greatest stories, and there is a retelling of it in one of Mackenzie's receipts. Here it is. So the substance that is used for whitening the skin for this face powder is called Magistry of Bismuth. And Bismuth Pearl Powder is four ounces of this Magistry of Bismuth, two ounces of fine starch powder mixed together, dried out, and finally, it a lot of steps, you make it into this lovely powder with which you can powder your face. However, it is well known, says Mr. McKenzie, that this oxide under the name of pearl white is used as a cosmetic by those of the fair sex who wish to become fairer. A lady thus painted was sitting in a lecture room where chemistry being the subject, water being impregnated with sulfurated hydrogen gas, which is also known as Harrogate water, was being handed round for inspection. On smelling this liquid, the lady in question became suddenly black in the face. Every person was of course alarmed by this sudden chemical change but the lecturer explaining the cause of this phenomenon, the lady received no further injury than a salutary practical lesson to rely more upon natural than artificial beauty in the future. Oops, that's a great story from Mackenzie. Thank you, sir. So I have a couple of great receipts that you can use 
that are interesting but not harmful. The first is called ointment of hog's lard. And you can imagine what the main ingredient is. Take prepared hog's lard, two pounds, rose water, three ounces. Beat the lard with the rose water until they be mixed. Then melt the mixture with a slow fire and set it apart that the water may subside. After which pour off the lard from the water, constantly stirring it until it be cold. This ointment may be used for softening the skin and healing chaps. So basically, use lard as lotion. Why is the rose water there? To take away some of the lard smell because lard smells. Second, here is one called balsam for chapped lips. Take two spoons full of clarified honey with a few drops of lavender water or any more agreeable perfume. Mix and anoint the lips frequently. Honey on your lips. Now my personal favorite receipt for a lip balm or lip salve is olive oil, spermaceti, which is whale oil, and wax. Now, when I made this, I didn't have any spermaceti, so I just used the olive oil and the wax. And it says you can use a little bit of scent, and you can also use a little bit of alkanet root, which would turn it red. So we didn't have that, but we used a little bit of scent, I think lavender maybe, a little bit of, we used wax and we used oil, melted them all together, mixed them up, and it made a lovely lip salve, just like your chapstick today. And then for cleaning the hair. New England rum, consistently used to wash the hair, keeps it clean and free from disease and promotes growth more than Macassar oil. Brandy is strengthening to the roots of the hair, but has a hot drying tendency, which, which New England rum has not. So rum or brandy. Okay, I wanted to talk to you about some really great resources that are books that you can read about health and hygiene. The first one is an actual modern book, and it's called Foul Bodies by Kathleen M. Brown, published by the Yale University Press. This book has all the research that I did when I was first doing research into hygiene back in the early 2000s, and a whole lot more. It's a great read. It's really interesting, and I highly recommend it. If you would like to read some of the Oldie Timey resources, these are books that are all available on Google Books and they're super interesting. I really enjoy them. Sometimes the information being shared is ridiculous. Sometimes it's just plain wrong. So obviously do not use any of these historical texts as actual medical or hygiene advice, but more just to inform you of what people were thinking back then. Um, some of my favorite Favorite ones include The Young Lady's Friend by Eliza Farrar, published in 1838. Um, the Frugal Housewife is a huge favorite by Mrs. Lydia Child. She wrote amazing things, um, lots of books that we use in Prairie Town, and you will see The Frugal Housewife on a lot of shelves in Prairie Town. Um, here's a, a book from the health standpoint written by a doctor. It's called Elements of Hygiene by Robley Dunglison, MD, from 1835. What's really cool is that Robley Dunglison wrote in the 1830s about what he called idiosyncrasies in a person's diet. And what it is, it's food allergies. He talks about people who have idiosyncrasies against strawberries or shellfish, some of the most common food allergies in the list today. As a person who developed food allergies in my 40s, I was really, really fascinated to see this guy in the 1830s writing about food allergies as an actual thing. Of course, I mentioned Mackenzie's 5,000 Receipts and later 10,000 Receipts by Colin Mackenzie. I cannot talk enough about how much fun that book is. You can even read about how to make ink. And finally, Miss Emily Thornwell in the middle of the 19th century wrote books about how ladies could learn to be ladies. Now, a lot of her advice is pretty mm, interesting for a modern person to read, but The Lady's Guide to Perfect Gentility is a great read by Emily Thornwell. 
Okay, that was everything that Jenny had answered for us. But as promised, I do have one last topic I wanted to mention just briefly here. Something that Jenny and I spoke about and I just thought it, you all should hear it as well because it's interesting and it's so relevant. So while the Civil War was happening, we had truly no idea about hygiene or antibiotics or anything like that to really keep our bodies clean and protect us from the germs and viruses and things that spread easily. Um, so the Union eventually started to figure out that if you kept yourself a little bit more cleanly, um, if you attempted to, it greatly improved your chances of living. Um, if you didn't all know this, actually more men died from sickness and illness and infection than they did the actual injuries that they were sustaining in battle. And of course that's very sad to hear today because we know now that that would have been all preventable if, if they had known what we know now. Um, of course that's not the case. You have to go through these things, these experiences to figure out how to protect yourself against them, right? We know that more than anyone right now. And so when the Union started to, to discover that if they bathed more regularly, if they cleaned their clothes and things, then they would uh, be healthier. The, the Southerners, the Confederates actually found out about it and it was sort of a thing that they made fun of the Union for. That's how that's how much hygiene was just not a concern to them at all. They thought, the Southerners thought that because the Union was starting to take care of themselves in that way, that they were like those Europeans and just frilly and worrying about things that they shouldn't worry about. And so I think that's a good illustration of where we were at that time. And because of the Civil War, because of how much illness and infection was spreading, um, our medical field in our country and just as a whole, it, it changed afterwards. People really started to look into taking care of hygiene uh, in themselves and one another, and they realized that one affects the other. If someone else is not hygienic, they can spread that to someone who was healthy before. And I just thought that that was such a relevant topic right now in this pandemic, when we have to worry about being so careful when we're going out anytime we have to, or um, having things delivered to us or anything like that. So I just wanted to point out that this topic of hygiene, it is not new, and it's probably not something that we'll ever not talk about. I think that it's a struggle that we're always gonna have, and it's never gonna go out of style, and we're never going to entirely beat it because we're always gonna have illness and viruses and infections and things like that, but I just thought it was interesting. And so if you're, if you're interested in that topic, there's all sorts of resources and things that you can look into because it is quite interesting how much the Civil War really changed our outlook on hygiene and how it kind of became um, patriotic, a symbol of patriotism to be hygienic because they were trying so hard to encourage it so people could actually live so they weren't being infected and things. So uh, that's all I had on that topic. Uh, thank you all so much for tuning in for this video and a big thank you for Jenny. As you all saw, she's wonderful and I'm very happy that she was able to help out with this video. So thank you so much. I hope that you all will have a very healthy and happy rest of your day. Goodbye.